Welcome to the second lecture in the series uh, Leadership in a Time of Turbulence uh, and Transition. In my last lecture, we advocated the leader as steward. And tonight, I will argue that this kind of leadership is especially relevant to a very important topical debate, uh, which is the big society. Now, I appreciate that the big society is something by which the government and the Prime Minister personally have set great store. In his Hugo Young lecture in 2009, David Cameron said, we need a thoughtful reimagination of the role as well as the size of the state, actively helping to create the big society, directly agitating for, catalyzing and galvanizing social renewal. Our alternative to big government is not no government, some re reheated version of ideological laissez-faire, nor is it just smarter government. Our alternative to big government is the big society. Now, I don't want to be party political or to make a party political point, but my view is that the big society transcends the normal left-right divide and is a very powerful idea in its own right. Indeed, it shows why that divide, as conventionally conceived, is increasingly outdated. It is therefore very pertinent to ask, what might the big society look like, and what sort of leadership will fulfill the vision of the big society? <coughs> My brief answer is that at the heart of the big society is the transition from an entitlement to an entrepreneurial culture. By entrepreneurial, I mean a host of intermediate organizations, public, private, mutually controlled, between the state and the individual citizen, which offer locally and in communities services which an over-centralized state increasingly struggles to provide satisfactorily today. It re-energizes society, arouses a fresh civic consciousness, and through involvement, on a scale with which people can identify, brings together the moral, spiritual, and financial elements of what it means to be human. It also promotes the country's well-being. Easily caricatured as happiness, well-being is really about wholeness of society and individuals. Well-being, of course, is another idea which is being pursued in political terms, specifically to try to capture what gross domestic product, a monetary value construct, largely fails to measure. Now, the leader as steward manages the community's resources for the long term in the interests of the whole community. His legitimacy derives from getting others to buy into his or her vision of the future, a vision which may be larger than themselves and even one that they did not expect and being seen to fulfill that vision in the interests of the whole community. In the big society, this becomes a new model of a distributed, bottom-up leadership using the tools of the digital age to reawaken the best of what lies often neglected within communities and to stimulate a new breed of leaders. This is new, a new movement a civil reawakening of grassroots entrepreneurs and a real and radical social shift, and not just another idea. That is the undergraduate answer. But let me try a postgraduate analysis. <coughs> we need to understand why the idea of the big society has arisen. In the UK, and more generally across the Western world, the post-war social settlement is losing effectiveness and support, a sign of the turbulent times which are the backdrop to this lecture series. The financial crisis, whose monstrous offspring is the Euro crisis, has prom prompted some anguished reflection on the limits of the convention, conventional nation-state in a globalized economy su subject to systemic shocks. Under the post-war settlement, typified in the UK by Lord Beveridge's vision of a kind of enforced but liberal egalitarianism, famously set out in his book Full Employment in a Free Society, 
citizens see relatively high taxation and a degree of personal liberty to the state. In return, the state provides a wide range of services centrally and often without distinction between individual and universal benefits. The autonomy of the nation state was taken for granted. In the 1940s, the UK was beset by a balance of payments and sterling crises, but it was assumed that government had the power to resolve them. This managed welfare capitalism was based on the age-old lesson that economic success is built on strong social foundations, social cohesion, community, compassion in the sense of caring together and individual well-being. But it required an efficient, centralized and large state which commanded extensive resources and a widespread support, a state which the UK had not fully seen before the exigencies of fighting fascism made it essential and popular. Managed welfare capitalism was attractive. It was certainly preferable to the misery of the interwar period. For half a century, it enjoyed success in reducing, if not removing, Beveridge's five giants, as he called them, want, ignorance, disease, squalor, and idleness. <clears throat> but in reality, it was only feasible in a relatively small number of countries, mainly, mainly the advanced Anglo-Saxon and European democracies and Japan, where conditions encourage this type of social intervention from above. Today, however, the big state is increasingly less effective in meeting the social goals set out in the 1940s, even in those countries where conditions most favor it. Without a fresh approach to building strong social foundations, our economy will continue to disappoint and society will become more fractious, and above all, our humanity will be diminished. <coughs> we can see this in public services. Reform of public services has met with limited success. Despite heavy extra spending, for example, in the NHS, NHS productivity has fallen, and educational achievement in the UK does not compare favorably with many of our international competitors. Or take another social system. Tax and benefits have become fiendishly complicated. Inequality has not significantly declined and may even be rising. Many feel the state has become too intrusive, for example, by demanding DNA samples from the innocent. And despite the ancient presumption in law and custom that we can go about freely in our business, the UK has more CCTV cameras than any other country in the world except China. Over-centralization has subjugated local initiative and community in an attempt to find a one-size-fits-all set of social interventions. There are broadly three reasons for managed welfare capitalism running into these, uh, running into these problems. <clears throat> economic, technological and social. Economic. The state now commands up to half the national income. As any business knows, scale brings the danger of diminishing returns. This is especially true of services, and the modern state is the biggest service provider of them all. In addition to its basic functions of protecting the realm and maintaining law and order. Unfortunately, it's very hard to raise productivity in services. The problem is known to economists as Baumol's disease. After a seminal paper published in 66 by William Baumol and William Bowen, their argument was that service industries are hard to automate and standardize, and by definition, depend on the personal touch. At the same time, however, inflation means service workers expect their pay to go up in line with, and preferably ahead of, prices. Meeting the rising expectations of consumers, for example, in the NHS, often involves hiring extra workers. In addition, the heavily unionized public sector workers in Western welfare states understandably defend pay and employment stoutly. The upshot is that money can be poured into public sector services only to go out largely in wages without corresponding improvement in the service, which mounts to a decline in productivity. And the UK has seen exactly 
this phenomenon. The second reason for the fading effectiveness of the centralized state is the digital revolution. Information was once the preserve of the few. Beveridge epitomized the high-minded, very able and socially concerned expert who had an answer. But as WikiLeaks has graphically illustrated, it's become much harder for the authorities to monopolize information. Indeed, citizens can legally access information on a scale hitherto barely dreamt of and to do so legally. Now information is available to and is increasingly the entitlement of many. And they can challenge the state about detail and process, often with technologies which the state itself struggles to deploy effectively, that undermines and bypasses the top-down centralized state. And then there is globalization. In some respects, the digital revolution's handmaiden is revolutionary in its merciless march through conventions and institutions, including the state. Globalization is placing immense competitive pressure on Western welfare capitalism. And it's not too fanciful to ask, can the welfare state survive, Asia, survive Asian competitiveness? <coughs> The third set of reasons for the erosion of the welfare state is social. Paradoxically, the upshot of the state's well-intentioned attempt to provide, for all <coughs> to provide for all is that in too many respects, community interest has given away to individual interest. Far from cementing social solidarity, the welfare state has bred growing bands of free riders such as abusers of welfare and the tax system. Transfer of too much authority to the centre has deprived once very proud communities of dignity, identity and leadership. For example, it was common before the war for local authorities to issue their own bonds. Citizens bought them, not just because they were a safe investment, but also because it was an expression of community solidarity. For too many individual safety nets have become trampolines. And dependency has replaced and subverted necessary and desirable support for the truly vulnerable. While the scale of dependency is sometimes exaggerated, a dependency culture deprives communities and individuals of dignity, responsibility, and humanity. And as the state has faltered in its social promises, the West has seen a long-term decline in public confidence in politicians and officials because of their perceived inability to solve problems. In this country, anger over bankers' bonuses, give an example, has its counterpart in the scandal of MPs' expenses. Recent attitude surveys have indicated falling support for welfare, a significant finding after half a century of robust support and for the incumbent political leadership class generally. Most significantly, there is a pervasive sense that the values which promote social cohesion and progress are lacking. Compassion, responsibility, fairness, trust. <coughs> the lack language is unfashionable, but there is a widespread feeling that we've lost a sure instinct for what is right and wrong. And as I've argued in previous lectures, we've neglected that most basic of guides to conduct, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. As a result, with honorable motives, we've allowed our humanity to become fractured. The financial, moral, and spiritual have drifted apart, and our communities are correspondingly fractured. Despite the best efforts of official agencies, People are isolated. On some housing estates, as you know, residents will only open the door to the postman and children suffer continuing abuse. And all this is an affront to all of us as citizens and human beings. People are not meant to be coping on their own. Aristotle famously said that man is a social animal. And he actually used the Greek word politikos, referring to the polis or the city or state. Generations of schoolboys, not to mention their masters, have rendered the translation literally as the more familiar political animal. But the word is actually more ambiguous 
and taken in context, it seems Aristotle meant that we are social beings who thrive on contact, conversation, and community. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we can't go on like this. For too long we've believed that we can keep hitting the snooze button, a reorganization here, a benefit change there, and a fresh day will bring miraculous solutions. It will not. There's a happy page missing, um, <coughs> which is one of those advantages. Of, what? Yes. Um, but I believe we must make a transition to a new form of government, a new way of meeting social and community objectives, a new contract between the state and citizens. We must reassemble the elements of our own human essence. We have spiritual desires, the longing for happiness, a moral spirit, an instinct from doing well, which comes from doing right, as well as the financial imperatives of which we have been allowed to become the yardsticks of our accomplishments. Now, combining the moral, spiritual, and financial into a revitalizing, organic whole amounts to nothing less than a civic awakening. My vision is of a flatter, a more distributed, lateral society in which a rich and dense network of intermediate organizations serve citizens independently of the state. Citizens will have to take more responsibility for themselves and for each other and society as a whole will be strengthened. Now, this does not necessarily mean different social goals. For example, the reduction of poverty. With or without the big society, we face the same challenges, the environment, organizing production, law and order, social morality. Nor does it necessarily imply spending less on achieving these goals. The point is that people will have much more scope to make choices about what services they want and how they are provided and who runs them. Then they are likely to spend more of the total on these services and the state is likely to spend less. I know that this vision begs huge questions. Will Whitehall really cede power? Where is the frontier between the state and non-state bodies? And most important, do people want the responsibilities of leadership that the big society implies. Now, these questions must be addressed. But our purposes this evening, I would like to just pick up the thread of leadership again. Who will be responsible and accountable in this big society? It is useful to think of society as having three levels, citizens, including the individual and the family, neighborhood groups, social, private, and state providers of services, and government. We've grown up with a system which essentially executes policy from the government down through many public providers of services to citizens. In the big society, the flow is somewhat reversed and vitally more interactive. That means the state voluntarily relinquishes powers to the intermediate bodies in my topology above. The supplicant becomes the supplier. In so doing, he or she starts to fill the vacuum which has developed at the community level over the last decade or two. Let me attempt to put some flesh on these bones. Myriad of bodies can fill the space central government vacates, local councils, mutuals, schools, microfinance, the proposed big society bank, companies, affinity groups, faith bodies, volunteers, all sorts of organizations from which citizens and communities are willing to order services. Very often, these will be affinity groups, people with common interests or a community agenda which they wish to further through their own organizations or others they, con <coughs> they contract to do the job. New organizations will doubtless spring up, but the inspiration and history are lodged in our folk memory already. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. It already exists. Take two cases. In the shape of the Women's Institute, founded in the UK in 1915, and the Cooperative Movement, of which more in, in a moment. We're all familiar with the army of charities and associations which vie for our support, hard evidence that there are foundations on which to build. 
People old and young can find new outlets for their skills. How to tap the vast talents and experience of older people and help ease the pensions crisis is a pressing concern today. Most of us can expect longer and healthy lives than in any other time in history. But the old remain in largely neglected resource. The legion of retired professionals, accountants, vicars, doctors, service personnel, lawyers, and so on, is a massive pool of expertise, as is in the population in general. But even more important, that younger people rediscover the value of being more connected with their communities. What better than Generation Y, the digital generation born between the 1970s and the end of the last century, committing its prodigious energy and talent to the sort of society it wants for the future. The popularity of ch charitable giving, of charitable gap years for university students, the competition for jobs with NGOs, and the spare time young professionals devote to good causes all give the lie to the charge that younger people do not care. What better, therefore, than combining the energy of the young and the experience of the old in the community of interest. Nor are physical resources hard to find. Buildings such as churches and schools can be a roof over the heads of community groups. Let's be bold and rip out the pews in sadly deserted churches and make the spaces available to a new breed of community entrepreneurs. And why should citizens not meet in their own homes as the King James Bible proclaims, charity just never faileth. All this sets up competition between suppliers, competition which is local and directly engaged, competition between commercial suppliers, voluntary suppliers, intermediate groups, such as professional not-for-profit charities. There'll be no big society without robust entrepreneurship which can also strengthen the country's economic recovery in the short term and underpin its competitiveness in the long term. In short, the big society releases the little platoons. Supporting the little platoons, however, will be a bigger battalion, the big society bank. I cannot emphasize the importance of this institution too much. The, that the bank can be the spearhead of a new 21st century citizens' movement, which through welding capital to local knowledge and expertise, stimulates the financial grassroots. It will be critical to providing citizens' groups with the financial wherewithal to fulfill their community ambitions. Its point is to be an umbrella energizer for volunteers and entrepreneurs starting small businesses and organizations to serve their communities. This will be community-inspired capitalism, which will help in the much-needed rehabilitation of the very nation of a bank. Localism, entrepreneurship, and a new business model will distinguish the movement. With help from the bank, community groups will be able to get together to provide cost-effective services, such as care for the elderly, and, and this is fundamental, share in the returns. The bank can draw on microfinance to show that finance can serve communities in palpable ways, harnessing local entrepreneurs to meet local needs identified by local people. This bottom-up financial model will create new spaces in which the best instincts of individuals, frustrated by an over-centralized state, can find expression to help each other and flourish together. With finance from the bank, we can harness the energy of the young and the experience of the old, tapping into a rich vein of talent for which there are far too few outlets now. To realize these ambitions, the Big Society Bank must have several defining characteristics. First, it has to be fully independent of the state. The bank cannot plausibly help to fund community organizations intended to take over state functions if it's tied to the central government bureaucracy. The bank's founding charter ought therefore to declare its independence and its legal form should embody that independence. Second, the bank has to be profitable, but without aping conventional finance. 
funding robustly entrepreneurial alternatives to state provision of services, whether through social entrepreneurs or conventional commercial bodies, distinguishes it from normal for-profit lenders. But a reasonable return on lending is essential. The bank symbolizes a grassroots capitalism which recognizes that making money is a moral imperative and so sets an example of prudent contact, conduct to other big society organizations. Such substituting waste by the little platoons for waste by the big state can hardly be deemed progress. Third, the bank should be pivotal, pivotal to the connected green and digital revolutions at the local level. <coughs> it could, for example, offer a platform on which communities can bid and offer funds. Communities can now command a degree of detail, which until recently was the preserve of the central state and one of the justifications for top-down command and control service provision. By contrast, the big society thrives on a much greater interaction of information and influence between the state, intermediate organizations, and individual citizens. And fourth, the bank must be established for the long term. The big society is a transformational project, no less than was the emergence of the welfare state in the middle of the last century. Like the welfare state, it will require broad and lasting political support to mature. The bank must not be allowed to suffer the fate of other socially minded financial initiatives and fade away or lose its identity. A concordat between the high street banks and the government would greatly help to secure the big society bank's position. The intention has been to launch the bank with capital from dormant high street accounts and contributions from the banks themselves. This agreement has proved elusive. But the amount of funding which the banks will inject into the new bank should be part of an overall settlement on the regulatory regime and would be a visible sign of the financial system's willingness to use bank capital in a socially constructive way. In the wake of the financial crisis and public disillusionment with the city, it would demonstrate that capitalism can reconnect with its moral moorings. This is far from being a purely instrumental matter, for there are three types of advantages to devolving power, financial, spiritual, and moral. The financial advantages include shorter lines of communication, better knowledge of the community, which may be a locality or a common interest group, and more immediate accountability. Competition can cut costs. <coughs> the result is superior services from entrepreneurs who communities know and trust. The spiritual advantages include community cohesion, sharing, the joy of giving, greater fulfillment, and more rounded lives of individually and communally. Thus, a retired NHS employee who helps to meet a community need, for example, in mental health, whether paid or unpaid, benefits personally and benefits the community. And a growing body of modern research supports Aristotle's description of humans, showing that people individually and collectively are more content when they cooperate with each other than if, as the standard economic model has it, we are each treated as agents struggling to maximize our individual gains. Here is a telling clue to the essence of well-being. The moral advantages are in strengthening the attenuated link between rights and responsibilities, and so creating the opportunity for a new kind of citizenship. In the language of political philosophy, the big society is a new contract between the state and citizens, between the citizens receive and what they give, and their expectations of receiving and giving. The essence of the contract is that the state steps back so citizens can provide for themselves the services they want in the way that they want. But the right to choose must be tempered by the responsibility to choose wisely. Community without responsibility easily degenerates 
into the tyranny of structuralistness. What I have in mind is neither the command and controlled society, artfully disguised, nor genteel anarchy. Put another way, leadership has not been abolished. Quite the contrary. The whole point is to unleash the talent which can forge a new type of leadership, to fill the vacuum created as power has drained away from communities to the centre, sweeping along with it ancient instincts of solidarity and mutual support. All this spells the end of the top-down model of leadership which pervades society from government to companies. Top-down leadership is a symptom and cause of the emerging weaknesses of the managed welfare capitalism to which I referred earlier. Top-down leadership has raised expectations excessively over a long period and thereby sowing the seeds of its own decay. It's encouraged a narrowly materialist view of what it is to be human, resting on frequently dubious cost-benefit analyses to form policy and failing to ask basic questions about what is right and what is wrong. And that in turn has stretched the link between right and responsibilities almost to breaking point. Evident though the failings of top-down leadership have become, we have barely begun to consider what kind of leadership will work in the new world, whose outlines we are beginning to glimpse, like seafarers stumbling upon an undiscovered continent as dawn breaks. In my previous lecture, I described the future leader as steward. The steward leader owes his position to the legitimacy followers confer on him because he manages resources in the long-term interests of the whole group. He's also able to get a group to achieve an objective which they did not think they could reach or even knew they wanted to reach by setting out a compelling narrative. Such leaders have a vision, but they understand how to get people to buy into that vision so followers who ultimately determine whether a leader really leads can be part of something which is much bigger than themselves. The twist here is that the steward leader may be found in all walks of life, not least because the smaller the social unit, the more unsuitable it is to command and control. And modern thinking tends to play down the importance of innate trusts, traits such as intelligence, emotional stability, conscientiousness, and tough-mindedness, and suggests that luck, timing, circumstances play a big part in successful leadership. This is important for the big society. At the beginning of this lecture, I defined the new model of leadership as distributed. By that, I did not simply mean that there will be many different foci of leadership instead of the more or less unitary focus of power we have at the moment. I also meant that leaders will come from all walks of life, no doubt in unexpected ways and from unexpected places. We can expect new career paths to supplant or at least supplement the well-worn route through local government to Quango and central government. Now, lest I seem idealistic, we should remember that something similar happened before. In 1844, a group of 28 weavers and artisans in Rochdale, then a leading Lancashire mill town, decided that they were fed up with excessive prices being charged for food and other daily necessities in shops owned by their employees, by their employers. <coughs> they set up the Rochdale Society of Equitable Entrepreneurs, the prototype cooperative, and launched a movement which continues to this day. The Rochdale pioneers were ordinary people who took responsibility into their hands. They integrated their family's interests with those of a wider community, first the town and later the whole community. But equally important to their success was the business-like business -like nature of the enterprise. They sold unadulterated goods at fair prices and introduced the patronage dividend, the divi, as it became known to generations of co-op members and customers. Membership of the society was not an idle responsibility. Active members, those who spent money in the shops, 
were rewarded with the Divi. The birth of the cooperative movement furnishes us with another relevant lesson. By definition, a cooperative implies group rather than individual leadership. I'm not advocating cooperative leadership as the panacea, but in today's world, digital technology, education and social awareness mean that a new and successful group, a local education provider perhaps, is itself a form of leadership. The empowered group is a leader. In the mid-19th century, this type of leadership and community self-help was unexpected, innovative and to some minds a disturbance of the established order. Leadership in the big society will involve more disturbance, although I hope it will be enjoy a wider welcome this time. For a defining feature of a new leadership model is what I call creative messiness. By this I mean the absence of uniformity, of one-size-fits-all solutions, the presence of much more diverse and representative cohort of leaders, especially at the community level. <coughs> The consequence may be uncomfortable, and it may take a while for people to adapt to them. For example, if decisions are decentralized to health services locally, we must accept that the provision will not be identical all over the country. Citizens will be, have to accept that local variations in health care are the result of their expressed local choice and not just a postcode lottery. The unevenness between communities in the provision of truly local services, as distinct from local variations on a national theme such as the NHS, might be even greater. Some experiments will fail and others will disappoint. There will of course be successes too, many successes I believe, but leadership of any sort is tested by adversity rather than by success. It's clear therefore that the new leaders will have to deal with the richness of the social fabric which will develop as the big society takes root. Decentralization, local empowerment, new or revived social intermediaries, a greater sense of personal and civic responsibility, a different kind of leadership, these are big changes. But the prize is the rehumanizing of society. The outstanding lesson from the financial crisis, as I have argued before, is that for too long we have suffered a thundering of the financial, the spiritual and the moral elements of our being. We allowed the financial to trump the moral and the spiritual. In the simplest form, we lost sight of right and wrong. Like Humpty Dumpty, we've had a great fall and fragmented as individual humans and as communities. But whereas the king's men in the nursery rhyme failed to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, we must succeed, and humanity must be reconnected with itself. There can be no greater task for leadership, but let me suggest three practical measures to nurture the new model of distributed leadership. <coughs> First, found a leadership training program to equip communities with the skills and confidence to take over from central government, perhaps under the aegis of the big society bank. After all, the risk of sounding patronizing, communities have become like individuals who've lost the power of a certain muscle through inactivity. The capacity is there, but it needs rebuilding. The devolution of power will not succeed without the necessary personal as well as financial capacity. Each financing by the big society bank should include a component for local capacity building at least in the early stages of the organization being funded. Uses of the capacity building component could include training leaders and staff and their recruitment. Communities should set up an electronic leadership forum to exchange experiences and find leaders. Communities could draw on existing local expertise, say in universities and further education colleges, to manage this and other aspects of their digital business. Ladies and gentlemen, what is required in this era of turbulence and transition is a new civic reawakening, a new movement based on affinity groups, locally empowered, 
which are incountable to the community and inspire their own leadership. We need to rediscover the potential richness and depth of civic awareness and action which lies within each and every one of us. We still stand on the edge of the largely unknown territory of the digital age, but the outlines of what lies ahead are visible. A flatter society in which citizens are economically active providers for their own needs and create their own leadership. This is not just an idea. It is nothing less than a transformation in how we think and act. It's a call to action which demands change at the grassroots, action to forge a very different future. Greater personal and community involvement rebalances rights and responsibility. It clears the air for fresh intellectual, social and spiritual influences. It's a big step towards reintegrating the financial, moral and spiritual in our lives individually and together. It's the basis for emphasizing well-being instead of national income as the yardstick of progress. It sounds a little ambitious, a sketch for the 21st century. Beverage, <clears throat> that's because it is. For a 21st century beverage, that's because it is. And because I believe it to be a pressing necessity. I'm also acutely aware that so momentous a transition from individual to community will almost take a decade, just as the roots of the 1945 welfare state stretched back for at least a half a century. So to conclude, it is all the more important that we nurture the right kind of leadership for us to make the transition from turbulence and towards a new reality of how citizens can work more and take more control over their lives and the communities in which they are operating. Thank you very much. Thank you.